we have time for questions and comments. عجبتك ترجمة التضافر <تصفيق> لأنه من فكرة الظفيرة يعني you know you create something you have two but cooperation تعاون يعني تعاونية I, I, I just chose this, this word to do it وثينا I didn't understand how how did you do it, both of you? I mean, uh, did you take uh, say two poems to translate? He uh, he took another poems to translate, or did you take the same poem? And uh, I mean, how did you do it? Yeah. Okay. The first thing is to choose the poet, to choose the poet that we want to work on. You know. So I like. Uh, Qasim Haddad very much. I like his poetry very much. Uh, and within his poetry, I mean, he has several diwans and so on. I thought the most appropriate one to choose, I mean, I like many of them, you know, especially the latter works, maybe not as much as the earlier works, which are more sort of direct and more political and so on. Uh, I wanted to choose something for translation that will speak to the audience, you know. So if you if you do so, if you do it on a on let's say let's say uh, Taraf ibn al Abd, you know, people don't know who Taraf ibn al Abd is. I mean, we we think very highly of him. He is, you know, uh, very important in our culture. But for them, it means nothing. But when you do Majnun Layla, it means something to them. So I thought that would help us in introducing him, in translating him, and introducing his work and so on. That's one thing, okay. And then we thought that if we want to present the poet, it's important to present to present samples of his other works, so that you can see him. You know, you can see his, you know, poetic uh, uh, trajectory or development and so on. So anyway, once we decided to do this, you know, of course I read and he read a lot about about whatever is available on Qasim Haddad in in, in criticism, uh, comments, and so on. And, and then we start with the poem, and I will translate it first, uh, kind of a literal translation, and then another translation is what I think, you know, you can't, you can't just translate things literally in, in poetry and so on, a more, let's say, a more poetic or a more literary translation and so on. And then you look at it and we'll sit and discuss things because you can't put everything uh, in writing and so on. But he has two models, you know, sometimes more, sometimes three models. And then we'll discuss the, the words and, and the peculiarities, the significance of syntax and things like this and so on, okay? And then, you know, he will translate. I mean, we didn't, we didn't necessarily do it poem by poem. Like, I'll do, you know, a few poems and send it to him, and then he'll do it. And then we'll sit and discuss it and so on. And then he'll, he'll propose something, and I'll say, uh, well, this doesn't work here, it works here, not there, and so on, and so on. We continue to discuss it until we come to a version that is both he thinks it's fine and I think it's fine. And that's when it is, I wouldn't say it's the final version, it's the penultimate version, it's the version before the last, and so on. And we go on doing like this uh, with all the poetry, with, with the whole collection of uh, chronicles of Majdun Layla, until we uh, we're finished, then we showed it to uh, to a colleague Walid who looked at it, and then we uh, we uh, published it electronically in Kalima so that we can get a reaction and we get reactions and so on. I mean, my attitude, my first attitude was to translate the title, which is Akhbar Majnun Layla. How do you translate Akhbar Majnun Layla? I mean, he's also making fun of the Akhbar, which are not really truthful historical accounts; they are made up and so on. So at first I thought of doing something which is it's a French word but it's also used in English which is majnun layla encore you know it's one more time where we have it and so on but you know not everybody thought of this so we settled on the idea of the chronicles but of course it's chronicles in a very ironic way because we think of chronicles as history we think of history as factual but he's really trying to show there is nothing factual you know 
it has all been changed and uh, is contradictory events and so on and so forth. Did you have a question, Humphrey? <coughs> yeah, all the way in the back, please. Which one? Which one? Uh, I understood that you did most of your work at a distance. Is that correct? No, Back and actually, forth on... actually, we did most of it together. Okay. My... Here in Cairo. But, you know, there were times when he wasn't around and we did, we did that by, uh, I see. by I see. email, which he referred to, yeah. Okay, the question still works because I, I was thinking there must be... It's two presumably very different modes, uh, sitting across a table from somebody and hearing their voice as they read the poetry and, and, and even their body language and a whole range of things. And then the other one, in which even at a distance, one supposes there may be some advantages in that you perhaps have to work harder to explain and yes. to make absolutely clear. Yes. And whether you have a preference for one mode or the other, I think both are essential to the process. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, my tendency will be to do it face to face, you know. Uh, where you can, you know, uh, uh, not just write something, and how much can you write, you know, to, to explain something when orally you can meet with, with someone and so on. But most of it, as he says, we did it in a house. Sometimes we would meet in, a, in an office, in the university office, but then there are all telephones coming, students coming and so on. So, for, so we decided to meet in, at home, you know, and discuss uh, these things and so on. But I want to say something. Now we have something like Skype. I have actually advise, supervise an entire MA thesis by Skype, because the, uh, I was away, and then when I came back, the person was away, and so on. So Skype is really very helpful, you know? You can, you can see the person and talk about things, and so on. So it takes the place maybe of email and of writing, and so on. Uh, Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, a reassuring uh, speech about collaborative translation, <laughs> because this is something that is often ignored. Uh, it's not an option that a lot of translators choose, uh, but uh, thank you for giving us faith in uh, collaborative translation. I have two questions. One, about the, 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 the quotation from Salma Khadra Jayusi that you mentioned, mm -hmm. where she said that uh, poetry cannot be translated except by a poet, and I often think this is a bit unfair. Um, I mean, somebody who has sensibility for poetry can, at least for me, uh, in my opinion, can translate poetry, not necessarily a poet. My other question is about um, the fact that in, in, in the case of the collaborative translation you are describing, it was not only collaborative translation, it was also done by the other person. I mean, you obviously, you know Arabic and English, but the other person also knows Arabic and English. Uh, so in that case, do you think it would have been the same if the, the other person who was translating was only an American poet who does not know Arabic? very well, or had, had not studied Arabic literature well. Well, actually, uh, John did not know Arabic very well, but, you know, had lived in the Arab world. You know, he knew enough Arabic, you know, to figure out things and so on, but I, I wouldn't say, you know, he, he could possibly take these poems and read them on his own and figure what they are on and so on. But let me just say about Salma Khadra Jayusi. And that's why I, I refer to the translator of uh, Adonis, who said you could be either a poet Either you are a poet, or you could have been a poet, you know? So in other words, you know, wh whatever that means, you know, you have the sensibility that you are saying, and so on. Uh, so, you know, you can take it or leave it. But I think, um, generally speaking, you see, I mean, I, I love poetry, and I read poetry, and so on. But I don't, you know, I don't write poetry, not in Arabic, not in English. So I, I think, I mean, I have done translation. I did Muhammad Suleiman, the um, so, uh, Solomon Rex. I translated it by myself, you know, and it was published and so on. But somehow I feel it's always more fun to have a partner. For one thing, when I translate, I can't really decide this word or that word, this inflection or that inflection. I'm, I can't be decisive in these things and so on. So it's nice to have somebody who takes the responsibility of telling you, you can do this or you can't do that, you know. Uh, it just adds, you know, to it, you know. 
is like when you, even when you write uh, an article and so on, you know, you like to show it to someone who tells you, but you were not clear there, or your argument falters there, or something like that, you know. But, it, but in his part, is more than that, you know. And then it's nice that I translate it in a certain way, and then I can see what he does to it. I mean, there's a kind of magic, poetic magic, you know, uh, that, that turns the, the text into actual poetry. <sighs> I want to ask a question. <laughs> um, I'm fascinated by the fact that the, you, you have this long history with yes. the same person yes. in code translation. Yes. Yes. And I'm guessing that like any other sort of project, long range project, you know, you start off with certain strategies and then you revisit them, redefine them, there's a history to this relationship. Has it changed over time? Have you changed the way you work? Um, have you adopted new... Uh... I mean, I would have to because now he is retired from AUC yeah. and he's in uh, uh, New Orleans and so on. So if, if we do something... I mean, I would like to do Abu Nawaz. That's what I would like to do. You know, he's a modernist. Abu Nawaz is as modernist yeah. as you can get. <laughs> they yeah. arrest you for him. <laughs> uh, but the thing is that, let's say, in the beginning, maybe we spent a lot of time, you know, explaining things and so on. As you work with someone, you you, you know, you can use more economy in how you present something because you are you've become closer to each other and you know what's expected or what's not expected and so on. You mm. know, mm. so in that sense, it becomes easier with time. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, that familiarity becomes helpful, you know, that we've gone through it and we know what it is and so on and so forth. I don't know if I've really answered your question. Or something. Well, I guess it's something to reflect on, maybe, you know, yeah, yeah. over time, you know, how over time, has yeah. this yeah. developed? But, but as changed. I said, I mean, you can't just bring someone who is a scholar in, in one language and another one who is a poet in the target language and put them together. Yeah. I mean, there must be a chemistry that works. Come on. Come and it doesn't always work. I mean, I translate it... Um, a poem uh, by uh, Mata uh, for Selma when Selma was doing her uh, modern Arabic poetry. Uh, it was by, by Muhammad Afifi Mata and it was called Qira'a, recital, which is very uh, Quranic uh, allusions and echoes and so on. Uh, and she gave it to Desmond O'Grady, who was a poet, an Irish poet, and so on. And you know, he translated it. I have, I've used something, the cover, you know, that is used. I use mantle because you talk about the mantle of the prophet. And he changed it to cape. Uh, now, cape uh, is not the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, given the context, I mean, in some, in some poems, yes, you could have a cape, but this is not, we're talking about, you know, the mantle Lord. of the prophet. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like a, yeah, that's what people know and so on. And she did not object to it. And so there was no way for me to tell him, to explain to him yeah. why Cape does not work here, you know, uh, and so on. That's why I like to have someone with whom I can have a dialogue and explain things and, you know, uh, come to a conclusion, you know, yeah. satisfactory yeah. conclusion yeah. for both. So, on. But I remember she also told me that she wanted, uh, she had the translation by an Arabic scholar of, uh, Ibrahim Nagy, your, your grandfather, and um, she gave it, I think, to a great or to somebody else. I can't remember who, you know. And she said it came back jazzy, looking like jazz, you know, not <laughs> the romantic poet. It's, you know, it just didn't work. I mean, she could tell yeah. that there are certain things that don't work and so on. But she was the ultimate judge, you know. There was no give and take between me and the, and the translator, although I knew, of course, Desmond O'Grady myself. Yeah. Susan, we have a question here for him. Thank you. My voice doesn't carry very well. Well, uh, thank you very much, Farial. This is a wonderful presentation. And as you know, we um, took advantage of both your text and your cover last year at Georgetown for our presentations on the cost of that, mm -hmm. as well as your own presentation there. Uh, in terms of this, uh, um, the issue of collaborative translation, all of these things, a couple of things strike, uh, strike me, because we read a lot in translation theory about this. But in the end, the only thing that matters is the result. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. And sure. It doesn't really matter how it got there. Sure. Um, 
Uh, what strikes me about something like this, I don't know John Verlander's Ver Ver own yeah. poetry, uh, but it seems to me that he has a very nice touch for these modern things. I mean, he, they really, uh -huh. not only do they, they sound you know, much like Qasem Haddad in many ways, there's the same sort of aesthetic there, but also it sounds like real modern American poetry too. It doesn't sound, it doesn't sound alien and translated. translated. So my other question is, if you could compare uh, the issues of translating uh, somebody like Afifi Matar uh, and translating someone like Qasem Haddad, uh, we, that would be interesting to hear what, uh, how the uh, experiences differed in terms of uh, translation. <coughs> yes, I, I want to say that there is a danger, I talked about the perils of a translation, a collaborative translation, is that the poet will turn every Arabic poem into his, you know, it's very possessive, you know. Uh, so it, it, it will be more like Verlanden poetry than it would be like Qasim Haddad or like uh, Muhammad Afifi Matar and so on. But I'm watching. So if he does this, I'm going to say, no, you know, you can't do that, and so on, you know. I mean, look, look at the way Isra Pan ch translated. I mean, re you know, recreated the poem based on something, you know, that he read in Chinese or in the ancient Egyptian uh, poetry wow. and so on. I mean, it's really Isra Pound. It's no more ancient Egyptian poems of love that he translated, for example, you know. So uh, that's also the, the, the advantage of having two people, you know. Everyone is going to uh, defend the source or the target, you know, so on. But, but uh, uh, Qasim Haddad is, uh, is, a, is a modernist, is a, and he says this, you know, that Arabic poetry has been very much influenced by uh, modern modern poetry, you know, modern European, modern this and so on. Uh, and the very, the very title of Matar, Quartet of Joy, you know. But also, why did we choose this one of Matar? Because he emphasizes uh, four kinds of joys, you know, uh, the four elements, the earth, air, water, and fire. Okay, which is very kind of universal. I shouldn't say universal, but it certainly was in, in the Middle Ages, the Greeks had it. The, you know, it's something that people relate to, you know? So this, the divisions there and so on. I mean, I could have gotten something that's really very, very different. And, and I mean, the qira, uh, recital, the one I translated of Matar is also uh, very much anchored in Arab Islamic um, poetics, you know? But we did it. <laughs> okay, we take questions from here. And then Mona, but in fact, yeah. Aineki, Aineki ya unseya, qalat, ma lam takul lugati, lugatan taglubu qaysa wa fi dafiha. أضو في تلس أميري أو ربما عادت إلي مراهقتي لا تعبأ بهرمي قد شاب شعري فهبت قافيتي فانحنت قائمتي أمام عيناك عيناك تتوضأ الدنيا من عيناك تتفطر عيناي حزنا أمام عيناك مساءكم شعرا أنا استمتعت جدا بالدكتورة وخاصة عندما ألقت الضوء على الشاعر محمد دعافي في مطر ولكن السؤال اللي أنا بوجهه لها إزاي قدرت الترجيم الصورة بتاعت الشاعر محمد دعافي في مطر مع إن الصورة بتاعته بترجع إلى ريف المصري القرية المصرية الشوفات المصباح المنطدة المنطدة فالصورة بتاعت الشاعر محمد عفيفي في مطر ازاي قدرت الدكتور تترجمها الى اللغة الانجليزية وشكرا يعني هو محمد عفيفي في مطر شاعر فلسفي الى حد كبير فهذه طبعا تساعد طبعا كان لازم افهم المصطلحات الريفية المصرية يعني مثلا كان عنده قصيدة اني اتذكر ذاكر فيها جسر نحن جسر عندنا بالفصحى أو باللهجة العراقية 
يعني بريدج بينما هو الجسر هناك يعني الجانب اللي قريب من النهر اه فبعدين اكتشفت طبعا المساله وعرفتها يعني في اشياء مرات مر من كنت اترجم مثلا ادوار الخراط انا انا صار لي سنين عايشه في مصر يعني المفروض اعرف المصري والمصطلحات دي بس كنت بترجم فهو بيتكلم عن عفريته صفرة طب انا العفريته الصفرة يعني يلو يلو جني او something like this يعني how do you translate it and so on يعني استغربت يعني هاي ما تدخل بالسياق وهذه طبعا هنا الـ الـ الزميل الشاعر ما يقدر يساعدني يعني ما يعرف عربي لهالدرجة بس أنا من نوع الأسأل يعني لما شيء ما أقتنع به أسأل البقية يعني فاكتشفت أنه العفريتة الصفرة هي الأوفر اللي, اللي يلبسوه الناس يعني بس أنا طبعا ما عندي هل ما كان عندي هالمعرفة هو أصعب شيء بالشعر في ترجمة الشعر أنا في نظري Uh, it's when when you think you know what it is. When you know you don't know something or you're not sure of it, you look it up, you ask, you check, you do all these things and so on. But when you think you know it, and it turns to be not the right one, you know? Yeah. Okay, we have two more questions. Thank you, Dr. Razul, for a most fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, the reason I'm here today uh, is basically because you are talking, so we can't miss that. And the second reason is that uh, I'm interested in collaborative translation because I've been uh, practicing collaborative translation with Marsha uh, Lennox Qualey, uh, the American translator. Uh, we have been doing that for a couple of years without actually giving it a name. Uh, how we did it is that, um, if, if the text is from English into Arabic, uh, Marsha would do all the work and then I'll be editing that. If the text is from Arabic into English, meaning into her native language, I'll be doing the core work and she would be editing that. And um, uh, we did that uh, quite harmoniously, but we never actually thought of giving it a name and we never actually thought how we did it. We just we just did it and we did it all right. Now, since you are um, a much, much more uh, experienced collaborative translator, can you give us a manifesto for future generations of a people manifesto. who want? A manifesto? Yes, no. sort of. Uh, no, no. But guideline. I mean, well, I will tell you something. Okay. How do you think I theory mean, was comes that about? the best way to do it? Sorry? How do you think theory comes in translation studies? How do you have theory? Practice. Hmm? Uh, from practice. It starts with practice. You know, you formalize what you do. Uh-huh. And then you see how it is. Now, how did I come? I mean, I didn't think before of uh, the difference between collaborative and cooperative. But when I was asked to give this lecture, I began to think because, you know, uh, there is, uh, if we talk about solo uh, translators, you know, you could be a translator, as I said, who is a native speaker of the source language, or you could be a translator of the target language and so on. And mm -hmm. they call them, I mean, they have names for them. A, B, you know, translator, independent translator, A, you know, B, you know, they do something like this and so on. So I was thinking, you know, there is a difference between what Radwa, for example, did. They were all native speakers of Arabic, isn't it fascinating? Mm -hmm, yeah. And it was a critical work anyway, you know. And between someone who combines like you do, you know, someone who is different, different either in terms of native speaker of this language or that language, or discipline is different, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, for, I think, for example, I think, would you translate literature or do you translate literature? Something literature. Only literature. Yeah. Only literature. I mean, yeah. at, at least this is what we worked on this together. This is what you worked on. Literature, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, I, I think more research should be, do, should be done Absolutely. on this point because Absolutely. it's very interesting. In translation mm -hmm. studies, we need to do that. I mean, the, the Chinese yeah. are very good in it. You know, they've done it. And as I said, there is a conference in Hong Kong. Uh, about precisely about this, you know, and uh, Muna Bakers will be one of the yes, keynote okay. speakers there. Although she herself told me there isn't much done on collaborative. Course, if you look in her of encyclopedia mm -hmm. of translation studies, there's nothing under collaborative. Uh, thing. There no, is something. Actually whenever very you look at it, mm -hmm. you will find team translation, uh -huh. and it's usually scriptures or you know diplomatic uh, documents and so on or very long works or something yeah. like encyclopedias or something yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. i mean you 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 have to be careful when you have a co-translator that the other person does not put you down or you don't put down the other person i mean it has to be there should be some kind of equilibrium and understanding of each other you know 
Well, I, but when I think of it, we are good friends basically. So this facilitated a lot of work together. Yeah. And we both love translation. Yeah. And uh, I, think, I think this is a basic line. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Being on good terms. Being, yeah, being on good terms. But uh, I mean, I, don't, I know that being Steve, able to for example, each other. Steve has translation, Steve uh, Nemes, my chair, sitting mm -hmm. back there. Mm -hmm. He translates with a student. Now, I wonder how this works into power dynamics. Of you course. know, because students tend to be willing to please their professors. And I don't want somebody to be willing to please me. I want to defend, you know, their version or yeah. what they want to do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Doctor. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much, um, Dr. Friar. I'm actually one of the students of Dr. Friar referred to earlier. And congratulations. I just like, would like to share with you an experience, um, my experience um, after having lived with some, um, a translator of poetry for more oh, than 20 yeah, years. Yeah. Hassan. Uh, yes, and mm. I think this ties in with what Granda's you know, mm. comment on um, the poet translating poetry. And I would like to add that after 20 years of translating poetry, he discovered that he was a poet. So I oh, mean, right. you know, all I mean, right. you, you discovered yourself yeah, as you well. You are a potential you know, poet. Yeah. Exactly, you know. So um, um, my question is, have you ever come across, because this, I, I, I happen to be his reader sometimes, just because he would, if he doesn't find any of his, uh, you know, poet friends, then yeah. he resorts. He translated American poetry into Arabic, right? Yes, Hassan. and he translates yes. into English as well. Uh, he translates Arabic into right. English as yes. well, uh, both ways. But sometimes, and often I meet this, you know, I read a, basically if, if it were a prose poem, and when he renders it, to, my, to me it sounds more poetic than the original. Than the original. Than the original. You, he improves on then, the original. And, yeah. and a lot of times, I, I mean, I think one of the poems, you know, that we just read here, you know, when it's rendered into the other language, the tone kind of yeah. changes, and sometimes it sounds more, poet, more poetic. Now, in this case, you know, have you come across something like this, and what, what would you do, you know? Would you, like, you know, try to retranslate or make it tone it down, or I, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have you've experienced uh, any of this? Uh, well, you know, yeah, I mean, there are certain things that sort of, um, let's say, could read better in another language yeah. than in the original. It, it is possible, you know. But, I mean, there's also a question of taste, you know, what you think is a better poem, you know. I mean, it's, the whole thing is really, to a great extent, subjective, you know. Uh, so it depends, you know what we do. But I think what you said first, I thought, I thought that was very interesting, that people who have done translation of poetry then becomes a poet. It rubs you off. Know, as it, as what? It rubs off. It yes, rubs, it yeah, rubs yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it is true. Yes. It is true, you know. I think that, that's an interesting uh, phenomenon. I haven't gotten that far. <laughs> yes, but you know, my, my second point, it has to do with the intentionality. Yeah. probably, of, of, of the poet, you know, or the writer in general. I mean, if someone uh, intends to write, you know, a poem, but, you know, free or in prose form, then I don't think someone has the right to make it like, you know, sounding a little bit more different than what the intention was, or I don't know. Oh, or the, probably the author, who knows the what author. the intention, the poet's intention yeah. was in the first well, place. Well, you know, you know, the idea of the author is dead and so yeah. on. I don't believe no. in it. I don't believe in it. I think you should, whenever you can, you should be able to talk to the uh, to the author, right. uh, you know, or read about what other people have said about the author and so yes. on. And and uh, as John said, you know, uh, he likes to hear them actually right. the way they talk and so on. I mean, I think it's important, but I don't think the author is the ultimate decision maker on what the poem means, you know? Yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, we have a number of poets, you know, Melville said, you know, Moby Dick is not symbolic. I mean, come on, Melville, <laughs> that's not the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, people do say something, uh, do, uh, do, uh, uh, do sometimes say things that, to me, doesn't make sense. I mean, he's the author of the work. He can tell me this was my intention. But then 
the poem is also my poem, you know, because I'm the reader, so I have a part in it, I have a say in it, I have a role in deciphering it, and so on, you know. Uh, and uh, some of them, you know, they, first of all, many of them don't want to talk, you know, about it. I mean, Picasso was always asked about the Guernica yes. to explain this symbol, that symbol. He said, if I want to explain it, I would have written about it. But I painted it, mm. you know, and it's well, for you course, to, yeah, to do yeah. the, the work. And how did Qasim Haddad uh, like the, the translation? Sorry? What did he say about the translation? Qasim uh, Haddad. Haddad's English is not as good as, uh, definitely it's not as good as Al-Kharat. Al-Kharat was a, a commander, yes. you know, had a command of English. Matar knew English, but he always yes. said he didn't know it very well, you know, yes. the idea that he, even. But I think Qasim's uh, 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 English is not, is not that way, you mm -hmm. know, it's not, uh, he, he did not, you know, he did not comment. I don't think he yeah. can comment, you know, uh, on it, you know. I mean, he was very happy to see the book in English, yes. but apart from that, uh, I don't think he's in a position to tell me whether he liked or not liked, mm -hmm. and so on. And, and he really didn't want to have a say because I like always to ask him, right. you know, right. about certain things and what do you think? Because, he, you know, he doesn't have to read the translation. I could tell him, is this what in a way it means or it is this way or that way and so on. And he didn't want to get into that. You know, that's your job. You know, you want to do it, you do mm -hmm. it. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Thanks, Doctor. The final question. Hear this. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you about this particular collaborative experience with John. Mm -hmm. From what you explain, your roles are very clearly demarcated. You know the Arabic, you translate textually, and uh, you, you do a first draft that is more towards a creative text. And he, the poet, comes in and he turns that text into a more poetic text, mm -hmm. a very clear process. Is that only instigated by poetry? If you were translating a prose text, would you still engage in collaborative translation with this uh, translator or any other? Or is that something that only poetry made you think of? Yeah, uh, I mean, it is not just as mechanical as this, that I give a draft and he does another draft. I mean, we have discussion, we have, you know, so on. Uh, we did translate Edu al Kharat, Rama, or Tanin, which is a highly poetic text. I mean, it's prose, but it's, it's Kharat's prose, you know, which is akin to poetry and so on. Uh, no, I want to say something about translation. I translate without having to have someone help me, uh, critical. Uh, essays. I mean, I don't need anybody else to tell me how to translate them, you know, because I, that's my, my identity, you know, I'm a critic, you know, so I can translate without it. But when it comes to poetry or prose and so on, I translated a short story by Anita Desai, and it was not a difficult, not difficult. Anita Desai's style, you know, it's very similar. I mean, I was, I was not, there was no challenge, you know, it was very easy to translate, you know, and I always want in translation to have something that is Difficult to do. I mean, it's riway to sap. Yeah, yeah. She wants to say something, Bethaina. Uh, you know, when uh, Mr. Dennis uh, Johnson yeah, Davis translated you, translated uh, selection of my stories. Uh, he's a great tra translator, Absolutely. of course. But he, he used to show me the translations before. Uh, yeah, but you know English that. well. Yeah, I know English. So I, 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 correct, I had to correct him in two instances, you know. Uh -huh. uh, one, I was, uh, one of the stories was uh, describing uh, an Iraqi woman putting uh, the black cloak, al abaya, what, what mm, do you call abaya. It? black cloak, mm -hmm. abaya. And I, I discovered that he described it as if she is an Egyptian woman putting Mm. And abaya, you know, we we dress differently yeah. with abaya. We yeah. put it on our head. The uh, he he said that he translated that she put uh, puts the on abaya her, on, on her, her shoulders. shoulders. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, if I hadn't been knowing English, I wouldn't yeah. Uh, yeah. be able to correct him. You yeah, know? Uh, this is one instance, and the other. 
The local were, color, the local uh, yeah, things yeah, that can be a problem. You said, because you think you are in Egypt, you know, yeah, the Iraq, but yeah, the Iraq yeah. is different. Yeah. You, uh, you said something in your presentation which was very important about this, that you, the, a translator should know the traditions and everything mm. about uh, the culture of them. Mm. Uh, the other story, I was describing a woman who was hit, uh, with a simple poor woman who was hit with the news of her, uh, of the death of her small child. Mm -hmm. She, uh, you know, you know, uh, a simple poor woman wouldn't sit on a chair collected and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she would do something with her hands, hitting herself or doing, mm -hmm. and she was, I described her, sitting on the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's doing, um, trying to express her sorrows and mm -hmm. in every way we know about it. So he described her sitting on a chair and uh, she was ju mm -hmm. just as, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as if uh, yeah. she's a stranger. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I had to correct him to on correct this. Him, I said, yeah. no, 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 we, we but don't. It's, it's yeah. good of him that he gave you the material yeah, to look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but these, you know, these uh, are, Culture differences. Yes, you know? yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No, of course. So it's important that a translator sh should know everything about the culture of the yes. of the source. You know. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Faiza. Wow. Faiza. Uh, Faiza. So I just want to ask you: Do you think that after we translate, the reader should feel that this say is an Egyptian or an Iraqi or whatever? that the character, the original character, should remain strong? Or does it become international? No, I mean, it doesn't become international except that people can read it. It is, you know, it uh, becomes international in the sense that people can read something that was written, for example, by Buthayna, which was only available in Arabic, okay? But I don't think the character ought, to, you know, the character ought to have the characteristics that was given in the short story or in the poem and so on. I was thinking of what you said about Ezra Pound. I, I did completely dislike about Ezra, Ezra Pound. Yeah, and Foster and some yeah. certain people like that yeah. are making it. Uh, yeah, a different American poem. He's making it, it, make it Ezra Pound. Yeah. He's writing Ezra Pound, but, it's, but uh, saying it's, yeah. you know, love, love uh, yeah. poems from this. But then, okay, but you can still enjoy it. You can still enjoy it, but, but don't think this is the way ancient Egyptians wrote about love. You can enjoy it for what it is, yeah. I mean, I am very, uh, um, I like to have the original, you know, in it and so on, and not just use it to do something else, you know? But there are a lot of poets who do this, you know? They, they read something that has been translated by someone else. I think they've done a lot of this with Rumi, you know? Uh, they, there are so many translations of Rumi, people who don't know Farsi at all, you know? But they just read something and then they, you know, they do that. I mean, that's also, that's also is possible. I mean, but, I mean, that's not my line, you know? That's not what but it is. there be some kind of rules that no. if you are translating, the ethics of translation yeah. would be to keep no. it. Because there are different modes of translation. There's adaptations. There is somebody who is inspired by a certain poem or a certain thing, and then writes a poem and so on. I mean, you are saying, why do we call all this translation? You know, you want to have different terms for it and so on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Inspiration maybe is inspired. Yeah. But yeah. if he's translating, translating, I yeah. think you should keep the, the feeling of the country you're translating. Well, the feeling of the, of the of source. The, the of the language. source, yeah. yeah. Of the source, mm -hmm. yeah. You, you have a comment? Yeah, yeah, but in the case of Pound... Give him the... Give him. Yeah, but in the case of Pound, he, he, exa he wrote about this, you know. I mean, yeah. all the modernists had this idea of translation, apocryphal translation, and all the rest of it, you know. So uh, they had these, um, you know, pastiches and uh, uh, apocryphal translations like Borges and um, uh, Ezra Pound. So they did have a special theory about this. It's not that they were not honest or anything, you know. They did mean, you know, to... Uh, 
Yeah, so, but it is a form of appropriation of the other. Yes, and this is what is yes, annoying yes. Faiza because she is an Egyptologist and she can read these poems <laughs> yes, in the original. Of course, I but this is what they know? did with Omar Khayyam, yeah. the translation of his Gerald, of Omar Khayyam. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not really Omar Khayyam, you know. Uh, but I don't know what you call this, you know, you call it, uh, you know, there are different levels of translation, uh, different modes of translation and so on. And uh, you just have to, to be careful that when you, read, uh, when you read a translation of a work or of a poem, you know, don't, you know, assume that this is it. I always think that what is good about translation is that when you read something, I mean, if you read Ezra Pound and so on, if you are interested in it and so on, then you want to see how it is done by either by another translator, there are other translations of the uh, love poems, you know, or you even want to learn hieroglyphics to read these love poems and so on. Uh, well, not everybody does this, but some people will. To different terms. Rules. Rules, yeah. Uh. No, but I think, I think you know, as, as Fatten said, the translator should explain, you know, should explain what they did. I mean, we all know Israel Pound did not know Chinese, but he translated from Chinese, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have to have the different names, you know, for... Uh, Translation, translation, adaptation, uh, adaptation inspiration, what have you, and so on. Yeah. yeah, it's used in a very loose term translation, and even in lectures here, sometimes you have somebody, for example, talking about a film that was made on a based on a uh, on a novel, and this is called translation. You know, right? I mean, the term translation includes so many ways of. Using yeah, you some really else think that it really means to carry across, to translate, yeah. to carry across. Then, you know, under this larger umbrella, everything uh, is possible, you know, so long as you are carrying across. But this is where the origin, the origin is also a very controversial term, the original, you know? I mean, how do you know what Qasim Haddad really said? It's my interpretation of Qasim Haddad, you know? <coughs> Could be somebody else read him and see something else in him, you know? Uh, and so on, you know? And this, is, of course, becomes very clear when you translate scripture, you know? The different readings, you know, of a certain ayah or something like that, you know? They call it. Uh, they call it interpretation. Yeah, they call. But the meaning of yeah. Uh, for the Quran, but for the Bible, it's translation. It's called translation. Okay, and you know, it's just because there's a theological issue that it should not be translated and so on. That people don't call the translations of the Quran translation, but they are, for all purposes, a translation. Okay, I mean. You, you never can reproduce what is in the source language exactly there. You can never do that. That's impossible. You know, it's an impossible task. But you can approximate it, you know. Thank you very much, Fariel. Dr. Ayel, it's a No, no, no. Shukran, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Again. No. Thank you for the other, it's wonderful. And congratulations one more time. <clears throat>